Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Security Fixes with the Force.com Security Source Scanner. Y'all having a good Dreamforce thus far? Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, what the Source Scanner is and how to use it. So how to upload your code, retrieve your report, and analyze the report in order to resolve some vulnerabilities that may exist in your applications. So hopefully uh, by the time you leave here, you'll be able to resolve your own vulnerabilities before submitting that app to the security team at Salesforce for review. Here's a standard forward-looking statement slide. You've probably seen this a couple times. It essentially means don't buy or sell stock based on what you hear and see today. So uh, as by means of introductions, my name is Chris Hale. I work here at Salesforce on our infrastructure security team. We do uh, assessments of applications as well as uh, infrastructure that's both physical and virtual. Uh, I've been with the team for about three years. Hey, everyone. My name is Ahmed Khan. Um, I'm also on the security team. My focus is on web security, web application security. I do a lot of penetration testing and analysis of source code for vulnerabilities. And I've been at Salesforce for about a year now. My name is Robert Sussland, and I work on the App Exchange Security Review team uh, and also on the Force.com scanner. Uh, before we uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the scan understanding the results, I want to describe uh, what the scanner is and how it works. So this is a partnership between Salesforce and Checkmarks. Checkmarks provides the static analysis engines that we use, and Salesforce exposes those engines as a web service. Um, what, what the static analysis engines do is they parse your code searching for vulnerabilities. They're able to detect when, for example, user input flows into a Visual Force page or into an HTML page unescaped. Uh, they're able to detect when user input flows into a, a database query uh, not properly escaped. And so they're, they're able to automatically find vulnerabilities in your code. And then uh, the service sends you an HTML report containing all of the findings. Um, so now that you know what it does, uh, how do you actually get the scan? Well, first you create an organization. So the unit that we scan is the organization. And we scan all uh, Apex classes, triggers, Visual Force pages, and Aura definition bundles within your organization. We scan loose code or unpackaged code. We don't scan packaged code to prevent inadvertently scanning something not related to your offering. We also uh, don't currently scan the contents of static resources or JavaScript and buttons, things like that. Um, so once you have the code and an organization ready to scan, make sure that if you're a partner, that that organization is linked to your uh, partner account and partner community. So if you go to partner community, you have a publisher console there, and it's a list of organizations that are tied to your partner account, be sure to connect that organization to your partner account. Otherwise, you'll be subject to uh, more restrictive uh, usage of the scanner. If you're not a partner, you can still make use of the scanner, but you're limited to 360,000 lines of code scanned per year. Uh, and that uh, limitation is done by email domain as well as uh, organization. So online on our scanner help page, we have the full list of restrictions on how they apply, but this is the most important one. Each time you scan, you'll receive an email summarizing your previous usage, so you know how many lines of code you've scanned, how many you have left. Uh, next, make sure you have an author Apex uh, username and the org that you want to scan, because the scan will be done associated to that username. Uh, if you created a sandbox and you're scanning a sandbox, be sure to unmangle the email address. Remember, when you create a sandbox, everything points to example.com and the email addresses. Also, since we use the metadata API to pull your code, uh, your organization has to be able to support the metadata API. And you can't have any IP access control restrictions uh, blocking Salesforce IP ranges. Finally, we're not able to scan government cloud users through the portal. If you're a government cloud user, file a support case. You can still get scanned as every other user. You just can't use the portal to do it. So once you've got all of that prep work out of the way, just go online to our scanner portal. Uh, we just ask you to fill in three pieces of information, a username, a description of the scan, and pick which scan profile you want to use. 
please don't enter your password in the description field. It's a text area field. We don't need your password. We don't want your password. Don't give us your password. Uh, just give us the username. And then you'll get a job acknowledgment email. Uh, and it summarizes your previous us usage, gives you more information about the offering. And most importantly, it has a job ID. And that job ID field you would use when contacting support about any questions about the scan. Uh, then in about an hour, we've got tons of new servers. We've got their very powerful servers, new engines, lots of capacity. Uh, almost all scans complete in less than a half hour. Most scans complete in less than an hour. Uh, you'll get emailed to the email address on file for the author Apex username the results. So make sure you can access uh, the email address of that account. And it's just a zip file containing a summary of the queries that were run and uh, a description of the vulnerabilities that were found in your, in your org. If for some reason your scan doesn't go through, your job is rejected because you've scanned too many lines of code or you're not eligible to scan, uh, you will be given a referral link to use the Checkmarks uh, free trial. That's an AWS hosted instance of the Checkmark scanner. It's free to use for two weeks. Uh, that will allow you to complete your scan. So it's a stopgap measure. Just if you've got to have something done overnight, this is what you can do. Uh, and with that, now that you know the mechanisms of the scanning, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris to interpret results. Right. So let's say um, you've got your uh, report now, your vulnerability report, and you want to walk through and determine what it actually says to you and how to resolve those. I want to define a few terms we're going to use here. Uh, in case you're not aware. So true positives, these are things that the scanner detected that are vulnerabilities in your code. The scanner did its job. These are the legit vulnerabilities. It's not a, it's not a fake. It's, it's not a, an issue. These are things that you're going to want to fix. Uh, but the, the scanner is not infallible, by which I mean sometimes it can have mistakes. These come in two flavors, false positives and negatives. So a false positive is if the scanner flags a piece of your code as vulnerable, but it's not actually vulnerable. There are a few instances where this can happen. And uh, they're few and far between, but be aware that it's a possibility. And the inverse also, false negatives, that um, sometimes pieces of code are overlooked by the scanner or it's fooled into thinking it's not vulnerable when it actually is. And those are important. And we'll talk about how to uh, detect and resolve those as well here in a little bit. So here's an example scanner report, a snippet of a scanner report that uh, highlights a SQL vulnerability. So all I want to do is kind of go through what is uh, SQL injection, why it's a problem, and how you fix it in your code. So by definition, SQL injection is insecure construction of SQL queries with user-provided input. So the user gave you some input, you took it and put it in a SQL query without performing some sort of sanitization step in the middle. And that's what the scanner is looking for. It's looking for that flow of data without some sort of sanitization. So the classic example is here on screen. In the top code block, we're taking input from a user. In the bottom, we're using it, concatenating it into a query, and then running that query directly. Right? So it seems kind of benign, there wouldn't be a problem here. If a user comes by and gives you what you're expecting, a name, in this case, Bob. User inputs Bob. Your query is constructed like you can see in the top example. It runs, no problems, everyone's happy. But what if a malicious user comes by and gives you something that you're not expecting, like uh, characters that are in SQL syntax? So they could do test, and then in a, a single quote, and all of a sudden, they can now inject code into this SQL query. So they're running code, and your application doesn't know that it didn't come from the developer. They don't, the application doesn't know it came from the user. This allows them to modify the logic and uh, perform queries that you didn't mean for them to do. Now, you may have also heard of SQL injection, which is SQL injections, injection's kind of bigger brother. It can do a lot of uh, other nasty stuff, but in the Salesforce platform, really the only thing a malicious user can do is uh, change the logic of a query so that they can view fields and objects that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. They can't do things like take over a database process or update uh, a database, nothing like that. All they're going to be able to, to do is read the fields and objects that you didn't want them to read. So here's the problem, right? It's pretty obvious. Let's talk about how to fix it, right? And there's, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to solve this. I'm going to go through three in order of preference. So the, uh, the best practice is to use static bind variables. So instead of using that user input directly into a query, we can sanitize it by first saving it into a static bind variable using that variable in the query. So here's the same example from before, just rewritten to use this mitigation. So if you got a, a report and you saw this vulnerability and you rewrote your code like this, you're going to solve the problem. 
Another uh, good way to resolve this is to use the escape single quotes method. This essentially will take user input and sanitize it by replacing single quotes with escape characters. Uh, this seems like uh, you know, the best way to do it in a lot of people's minds, but there are a few important cases, we'll talk about this in a few more slides, where this doesn't actually work all the time. Uh, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve for all cases. But for most cases, this is a great way to, uh, to resolve that vulnerability. Um, another way you can use type casting, so strongly cast variables into a type. If you're expecting an integer, make it an integer. Use that rather than a string from the user. Um, this works in some corner cases, but static bind variables work even better. So use those. That's the best preferred method. Um, but in corner cases where you can't do that for whatever reason, type casting will work. All right, so I mentioned there were instances where escape single quotes is not going to save you. This is one of those. So sometimes <clears throat> it's necessary to create um, SQL APIs with field and object names that are string values. So in this example, we're not using the user input uh, in the query directly where single quotes will help. Instead, we're using this uh, foo a, foo b, and foo c as strings that could be controlled by a user. So if these contain uh, SQL code, something like that, uh, SQL syntax, then uh, this query is going to be modified. And again, you'll be able to, uh, the, user, the malicious user will be able to see things that they should not be able to see. Right? So if you're using escape single quotes here, we're not in a quoted context. This query is not in quotes, so it's not going to work. It's not going to provide any value for you. But luckily, there is a way to solve for this as well. That's to perform CRUD and FLS checks on the field and object names that you're using in your query. So this actually uh, gives you two benefits uh, in one fell swoop. So one, if the uh, field or object name in the query is SQL syntax, something like that, and you perform a check for the permissions, it's not going to exist, right? You won't have a uh, field or object with those names. And that'll fail immediately. The query never gets run. So you've solved that problem. And as an added benefit, you should be performing CRUD and FLS checks anyway on your objects and fields. And so you get that as well, baked right in. So you've killed two birds with one stone. And it's pretty great. Um, you could do this manually by mapping the schema and then checking, querying all those fields with is accessible. Or you can, if you're using an API uh, as a string literal, you can just perform that directly by using uh, the is accessible uh, that way. All right, so we talked about kind of how to identify these vulnerabilities and how to mitigate them. Let's talk about a few false positives and negatives that you may see on your report. So a false negative, I kind of mentioned this earlier, is where escape single quotes is used in a non-quoted context. And the scanner sees that and thinks, oh, the, the input is sanitized, right? They've used escape single quotes. The, the query is safe when actually it's not, right? If you're not in a quoted contact, context, escape single quotes is not going to help you. Um, so that's an example of a false negative. False positive, on the other hand, uh, would occur if you're performing some sort of user input sanitization in a way that's non-standard or that the scanner doesn't understand. So in this case, we're performing a is alpha numeric operation, which will identify if the string has single quotes and pass that right in if it does not. Uh, the scanner sees this input coming in, doesn't know that you did that sanitization because it's non-standard, and flags that as vulnerable. In this, in this case, it, uh, it really isn't. So keep an eye out for those. Again, they happen occasionally. But as you walk through your report, you can verify those through uh, manual testing. All right, now we're going to talk hey. about cross-site scripting. Hey, thank you. So cross-site scripting, or XSS for short. Um, so this is one of the worst vulnerabilities that come up in applications. And it's also one of the most common. So we want to detect this as early as possible in the development lifecycle. Um, in a nutshell, this happens when you have user input that's unsafely injected into the output or into the page that re that's returned to the user. So and there have, um, we have an example, like the SAMU worm, this big uh, worm that was done with XSS. So let's go into, oh, also, um, I mean, in terms of impact, uh, cross-site scripting basically gives the attacker complete control over the user's session. So the attacker could modify anything on the page. The attacker could steal data from the page. The attacker could. Uh, send requests on the user's behalf. So it has far-reaching consequences. Um, so let's talk about how the scanner detects cross-site scripting and how we can prevent it. So um, a few um, uh, uh, words I'll use, source and sync. So source is any source of user input, anything that's controlled by the user. So this could be stored in a database, or this could come from a URL parameter or this could come from requests uh, or headers. 
So anything that an attacker or, or a user could control would be considered uh, to be a source. And a sync is when that attacker controllable input is put back into the page and displayed to the user. And generally, we'll talk about unsafe syncs. Um, alert one. So alert is a commonly used, or alert is a, alert, um, is a JavaScript function. Um, I will use this repeatedly in my examples. Right? And, and we will just use this to demonstrate that you know, we pop up an alert box. Uh, we've executed some JavaScript. In real life, an attacker wouldn't simply pop up an alert box. An attacker would uh, do much more um, malicious operations, like stealing session tokens, or stealing data, and ex exfiltrating data, or you know, defacing the page, or anything of the sort. So whenever we, see, when, whenever we successfully execute alert one, we could assume the attacker won the game and has com a control of our, over our user sessions. So, um, so uh, cross-site scripting, uh, there comes in different forms. So we'll sort of focus on stored cross-site scripting uh, for the purposes of this short talk. And this, basically, the scanner will flag this whenever we have um, input that comes from a database. So our source is our database. And our sync will be generally a visual force page, or it could be an HTML page, or it could be some JavaScript. Right? And so whenever we have a data flow from, from the database to the page, and there's no sanitization in the middle, the scanner will flag that for uh, stored cross-site scripting. Right? So, um, so suppose you know, we're, we submit our uh, code for a scan, we get back a result, you know, and the scanner flags this for cross-site scripting. So this is maybe the simplest example of cross-site scripting in Visual Force. So we have an output text uh, tag, right? and then we have um, a name. Uh, field that we're displaying, and we, and we set the escape equals false flag. So by default, the Salesforce platform will automatically escape your code uh, and your fields for cross-site scripting. So when you do display it within the within HTML context, it will be safe from cross-site scripting. But you could turn that protection off using the escape equals false flag. And you know sometimes you do have legitimate uses for using for using the escape equals false flag. But so in this case. Um, this effectively makes this code vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So we can look at an example. So generally, um, so I mean, cat.name, this could be a contact object, or it could be an account object, or anything. And it's generally, um, let, we can assume that it's user controllable in this example. So the general use case would be you set the name to a, a plain string, a plain, some plain text, and it's simply rendered and displayed back to the user. So everything's fine. Um, but what, what an attacker could do is the attacker could set his or her name to open script tag, alert one, close script tag. Right? And because of the escape equals false flag, uh, the platform will just reflect that uh, code as is. So it won't do any escaping or encoding whatsoever. It will just uh, display the script tag. Right? So now when this code is uh, loaded into the page, the browser will actually execute alert one. Right, and like we said earlier, instead of executing alert one, the attacker could execute uh, code that will you know, steal sessions and uh, steal data. Right. So, so this is something, uh, this is a very simple example of cross-site scripting, and this is something the scanner will flag and that we should fix. Um, so here is a slightly uh, maybe more complicated example of cross-site scripting. Um, so we have an anchor tag that has an event handler. Right? So event handler does a window.open. So this is a simple JavaScript function. Um, uh, we have a URL. And then in the middle, like, you can see the bolded part is a merge field. So this, again, is an uh, attacker controllable field um, that we are inserting inside an event handler on the Visual Force page. So and you know, the simple uh, use case would be you have regular names. So in this case, the name is Bonsor. It's, uh, it's inserted into the event handler, and everything's fine. Right? Uh, whenever the user clicks on this link, it will pop up a new window, and it, it will open that page with those parameters. Now, what an attacker could do instead is the attacker could add some malicious characters. So in this case, what the attacker is doing is he or her, she is closing the, uh, the quote, closing the window.open function, and then appending some additional code. Right. So the platform does not autom automatically uh, escape this, because it only escapes for HTML, right, unless you're doing some special escaping. So 
this is another example of cross-site scripting. This will be flagged by the scanner, right? So if you have code like this and it is flagged by the scanner, then be sure not to dismiss it. Like, look at it carefully because this actually does allow uh, attackers to execute malicious JavaScript on your pages. So let's go on to false positives. So like Chris said earlier, false positives are things that are flagged by the scanner as vulnerabilities, but they aren't actually vulnerabilities. So the scanner will, will naturally isn't perfect and will naturally produce some false positives every now and then. So here we have um, some code very similar to what we had before. So we have an output text uh, tag with, um, with a value that's controlled by users. So potentially, it's attacker controllable. And we have escape equals false. So when the scanner sees this, the scanner will flag it for a stored cross-site scripting. Um, but you could be safe from cross-site scripting if you perform additional validation on the back end. So in my Apex controller, I have some code where I whitelist my sources. So the only time I will return a name to this output text uh, tag is, is only if the name equals hello. Right? So the only value that could be displayed um, in the Visual Forest uh, page is the text hello. Right, so if the attacker did insert some other values, it will they will never be returned to that visual force page. So, so this example is secure and safe from cross-site scripting. Right, so if you have and this is sort of a contrived example, but you know if you have similar um, code where you're whitelisting your sources, um, you um, the uh, uh, you you can dismiss this as a false positive. Right, uh, and then here's another example. Right, so you have an email field. So, and we have the escape equals false. So generally, you would assume that um, you know, attacker could set the email to anything. And potentially, it, he could set a uh, script tag, execute alert one. Um, but in this case, the email field is restricted. Like the platform restricts what, type, what characters could go into the email field. So, and specifically, it uh, does not allow less than signs or gra greater than signs. So you can't have a script tag in here. Uh, in this specific example, right? So, so you, um, you you might not actually do this in real life. Um, I don't uh, think people have too much use for doing escape equals false on an email field. But you know, if you had a similar scenario um, where you're using a field uh, that has restricted uh, characters in it and it successfully prevents cross-site scripting, then you could also uh, dismiss this as a false positive. So there are like various different fields that may apply. Um, if you go to the secure coding guidelines, uh, we have a section called the unsafe S object data type section. Uh, it will list all of the fields that are, uh, uh, that do, can contain malicious characters. So if you do use one of those fields, then be sure to uh, properly escape your code. So now let's move on to false negatives. So uh, false negatives, like we said earlier, um, are things that the scanner does not flag. So, so just because you run your code through a scanner, it doesn't mean the scanner will find every single vulnerability. So there are some types of vulnerabilities that the scanner is unable to find. So, so here are a few examples. Um, so here we have uh, three lines of code. Right. So the first line, this is uh, just a merge field inserted into plain HTML context. So this is safe from cross-site cross scripting. The platform will automatically uh, encode and escape that code. So um, attackers can't execute code over there. Um, in the second two examples, within a style tag and within a script tag, um, the platform does not automatically escape your code. Right? So if you have less than signs or whatever, any characters are just displayed as is. So in those cases, you have to be careful to um, escape your code. Now, um, now, when we're talking about the scanner, the scanner will detect merge fields within script tags, but it will not detect merge fields within style tags. So, um, so you know, if you are vulnerable to cross-site scripting, it will flag the, uh, the script ones, but you know, it, it will always, for, uh, at this time, it will always overlook the style tag. So be sure, if you are doing that for some reason, if you are uh, inserting uh, merge fields within style tags, be sure to protect that against cross-site scripting. Um, and then script tags, does anyone know how to protect uh, merge fields within script tags against cross-site scripting? Any ideas? <laughs> OK, cool, JSON code, right? <laughs> so if you, do have, um, if you do have a merge field within script, script tags and you do want to protect that against cross-site scripting, you use the JSON code function. 
Um, now, in this particular example, we're using JS in code, but this is actually still vulnerable to cross-site scripting. And so it's sort of tricky. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone can see why. But, um, and, and the reason is there are no quotes around that merge field. So JS and code typically um, uh, prevents the attacker from escaping out of, uh, out of a quoted context. So the attacker is forced to remain within a, uh, within a string. So whatever uh, malicious characters an attacker uses uh, will not be executed as code and will simply be used as a plain string. Right? Um, but in this case, the, uh, the developer of this code uh, did not use uh, uh, quotes around that merge field. Right? So the attacker is already in script context right? and is, is not within a string. So the attacker does not even need to escape out of, um, out of quotes. So the attacker could just uh, type in a plain alert one box um, as his name, and that uh, alert one will, uh, will execute. Now, the thing is, um, just because you're using JS and code in this example, this will actually fool the scanner. So when the, uh, when the scanner sees, like earlier, we saw um, in the script tag, we had a merge field within, uh, a merge field within script tags. And the scanner successfully detected, detected that as cross-site scripting. It flagged it, and it returned it in the report. Um, but when we, when we use JS and code over here, this fools the scanner. The scanner is like, OK, you know, the developer is um, uh, encoding um, his or her uh, merge fields, and it will not flag it for cross-site scripting. But this is still vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So this is an example of a false negative that we need to be careful of, um, and especially when we're manually reviewing our code. So, so that's a, you know, a quick overview. Um, so when you do get a generic result back, um, you want to walk down the path. So generally, you'll have a source. And at the end, you'll have a sync. And it will go through various steps. So you want to walk from the source to the sync uh, down each step. Uh, you can validate whether uh, the source is actually attacker controllable. So you know, if it's being whitelisted, you're, you're safe. If, if users can never modify those values, you're safe. Right? But if it is attacker controllable, then you, uh, then you have to be careful. Ch check whether the sync is actually uh, valid. So um, you know, if, if those values are being returned to users in a visual force page, you, you have to be careful. But if those values are only being used internally within the application, they're never returned to users in any way, uh, then you might be fine. And check whether you have any sanitization in the middle. So you, know, you may have uh, different types of sanitization that the scanner doesn't detect or the scanner Things are safe but aren't actually safe. So you want to look at e each of those steps. So that's cross-site scripting. In a nutshell, it was a very quick overview and how it relates to the scanner. We have a lot of good documentation. We have a lot of resources. Mm, earlier this week, we had plenty of talks at uh, Dreamforce. Um, you can go back to the website and watch the videos. Uh, the avoiding common security mistakes ones goes more in depth into cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Um, we have our secure coding guidelines. So this is very thorough, very comprehensive, and in-depth documentation that goes into each of these vulnerabilities and more. So it's written by some of our best security experts at Salesforce. So especially for advanced developers, you, uh, we highly recommend you go through that documentation. Um, we have the new Trailhead models. So at Dreamforce, we just released um, uh, Trailhead models specific to uh, to these topics. So we highly recommend everyone um, use those. They're very fun, very easy to use, and uh, also very comprehensive in educating developers about these security issues. We have the admin cafe uh, over there. Um, we c um, feel free to grab a cup of coffee, and we can talk security with the people there. And finally, we have the security booth. So the security booth to, uh, to my left back there is, uh, is staffed by our security engineer. So this is the actual security team at Salesforce, um, uh, se security experts in many different fields. Everyone's really happy to talk about security. So, uh, and we're staffed most of the day. So just walk, uh, come by with any questions at all. We're always uh, happy to, to chat. Um, yeah. uh, we'll be at the security booth for the next uh, few hours. If you have any questions or about uh, the force.com scanner, or security in general, come by and talk to us. We're 100 feet in that direction. Thank you very much.